behavior analysis is pure and simple, a scientific approach to understanding behavior. And um, behavior analysis, of course, acknowledges that there are biological, for example, neurophysiological, um, that there are cultural and there, there are all environmental factors that influence behavior. But behavior analysis focuses on the environmental factors because those are the ones that are easily altered or rearranged. It's hard to rearrange brain neurology. It's hard to rearrange cultural influences. In fact, of course, most of the time we don't want to. So we focus in behavior analysis on um, the environmental factors. Um, Behavior analysis thinks about behavior um, qu quite broadly. So behavior includes all of the actions that an organism does, human or otherwise, that can be observed and measured. Some of those are overt behaviors, that is behaviors that are publicly observable. If I do these things, you can see them. So I can ask for directions, I can feed my pet, I can praise a child, I can eat lunch, I can stand in line for coffee, I can have a conversation. Those are all overt behaviors. But behavior analysis also considers covert behaviors, that is behaviors that are only observable, if you will, to the person who's actually doing them, to the behavior, okay? So behavior analysis also considers things like thinking and remembering and problem solving and things that, if you will, occur in our heads. Um, so behavior in this profession is qu defined quite broadly. It's, it's not a narrow definition. In fact, I don't know that there's anything a human organism does except for automatic functions like digesting food that wouldn't be considered behavior. Okay. Um, now, behavior analysis is a as as may noted for speech language pathology. There are many many influences. There are many many um, you know theories and perspectives that um, have to do with speech language pathology, and there are many branches, if you will, of behavior analysis in a somewhat analogous way. So let me just talk briefly about those because I think it's important to understand that behavior analysis isn't just one thing. It's really a conglomerate of a bunch of different things. So the, the first thing, the first area is the area of behaviorism. And behaviorism is a philosophy of science that is used by behavior analysts to answer certain kinds of questions, okay? So what is behavior might be one of those questions. Um, what's the best possible course of effective act action, and here we have the philosophical um, um, orientations of, of pragmatism or, or radical behaviorism represented by B.F. Skinner, the guy on your left, and also um, um, functional, functional contextualism represented by John Dewey, the guy on your right, um, and functional contextualism seeks to answer the question, how can we predict events using empirically based concepts and rules? So this is a philosophical part of, beha of um, behaviorism that, you know, often doesn't get talked about very much because it, it, it's philosophical I and mean, it doesn't have direct application to practice but nonetheless it's, it, it's an important part of the entire endeavor. The second part is experimental analysis of behavior. The experimental analysis of behavior con is, uh, consists of um, a, a branch of the practice, the, a branch of the endeavor in which we conduct basic research to identify the principles and concepts of behavior. We seek to identify, if you will, the laws of behavior. And I'll come back to this in just a bit. So uh, an, an experimental um, uh, behavior analyst might ask, how, how how do the different schedules of reinforcement affect behavior? If I reinforce every instance of the behavior, how does that affect the behavior, for example, differently than if I reinforce every second or every third or every fourth instance of that behavior? Right? To, again, trying to understand how that whole mechanism of reinforcement works. Or might ask about the kinds of environmental events that alter reinforcer effectiveness. And so some of the pioneers in this area um, are Charles, uh, include Charles Furster, um, who wrote the uh, seminal paper in the area of um, uh, positive reinforcement and autism in 1961, um, widely considered one of the first 
behavioral um, um, publications in that area, and also people like Marion de Meyer, who together with um, Furster in 1961 published the first um, behavioral pharmacology study um, looking at the effect of, of medication on the behavior of individuals with autism. So again, we, we, see, we see, in and this is the branch of behaviorism that um, people most associate with Skinner often because you know, of the Skinner box, where he had pigeons or rats, and he was trying to understand about reinforcement and extinction and some of those other laws of behavior, and did research on animals. But the experimental analysis of behavior isn't just focused on animal research, it also includes a lot of human research as well. But again, the point is to understand precisely how the laws of behavior work. The third area is what we know of as applied behavior analysis. And here, um, we conduct applied research to examine how those basic principles, basic laws of behavior, if you will, relate to socially significant behavior. How can we use those basic principles to change socially significant behavior? So we might ask questions like, what are, the, what are some effective ways to assess someone's preference for reinforcers? Or what are the effective teaching procedures that I can use in this particular situation to maximize my outcomes? What, what, what is the most effective way to actually deliver instruction. And here, of course, we associate this branch of behaviorism with people like Ivar Lovas, um, who wrote the very important and, and well-known 1987 um, paper examining the impact of early behavioral intervention on kids with autism, and also people like Judy Favell, um, who has done incredible work um, for many, many years in the area of self-injurious behavior and the application of the principles of behavior to treating self-injurious behavior in both children, adolescents, and adults. So that's the applied behavior analysis stream. And then the fourth area is the area of professional practice. And in this area, we apply the interventions, the evidence-based behavioral interventions developed in through applied behavior analysis to solve socially important con um, problems in natural environments. So we're now out of the lab. We're certainly not working with animals anymore, at least it, well, I mean, we could be hypothetically, but 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 often not. Um, and asking questions like, um, here are the goals. What kinds of supports and interventions are needed to accomplish these goals? Or what resources do I need to implement a behavior support plan with good contextual fit in the family home or in the school environment? So now we're working in naturalistic contexts. Um, and some of the people who whose names you may recognize, who um, have uh, made incredible contributions to this area of behaviorism include people like Laura Schreibman, who together with Bob Cagle and um, his wife Lynn um, developed pivotal response treatment, which is really an application of the laws of behavior and the principles of applied behavior analysis to the development of an intervention that can be used in home and school settings. And people like Mark Sundberg, who many of you know, um, has developed um, community-based, school-based, home-based interventions that, um, are, uh, that take the principles of verbal behavior and apply them in natural context. So we see these different branches. Really today we're talking about the last two more than the first two. Um, we're not here to talk about experimental analysis of behavior per se, but it's important to understand that the philosophy and the experimental analysis obviously influence how the others are enacted. So behavior analysis is, um, is applied across a wide range of individuals, context, setting, not just autism. Applied behavior analysis is like most definitely not just about autism. Um, and so there are applications in the area of mental illness, health psychology, business and industry. For example, organizational behavior management addresses questions like what's if I'm if I'm a, if I'm the head of a construction organization, how can I reduce accidents in the workers who are part of my organization? What are some effective procedures that I can use to decrease the accident rate to, or to increase the safety uptake, if you will, of the individuals in my organization? So that's a business and industry application. Obviously, many, many applications in the area of 
developmental disabilities in particular, but special education more broadly. Um, brain injury rehab uses um, the principles of applied behavior analysis and applies them. School psychology, sports psychology. I mean, there isn't any Olympian who hasn't been um, interacting on a regular basis with people with sports psychologists in the area of applied behavior analysis. If they won, even if they only won bronze, right? <laughs> you know, that, I mean, the, sports psychology is very much about how do I, how do I um, think about um, my performance differently? How do I train most effectively to get maximum outcome from my training? How do I visualize what I want my performance to look like at the end of the day? All of those things are um, come from the area of behavior ana analysis. Gerontology is a huge movement now in the area of treatment of dementia to use the to apply the principles, the laws of behavior to um, supporting um, elderly individuals who often will engage in a number of uh, challenging behaviors as a result of dementia um, so that they stay safe, so that they have good lives at the end of their lives even though they may be experiencing a deteriorating condition. Um, abuse prevention is um, very much active in this area. So this is a very, very broad area. And I think that's important because I think that many people who aren't familiar with the area think of it as an autism profession. And it's not. It's like so not an autism profession. I mean, obviously, with one in 88 kids being diagnosed with autism, there's a lot of demand for people with this background and training in the area of autism, but it's certainly not exclusive to that. So anything where my name is on it, this is my stuff, not Laura's, and I say that because if you like it, then fine, but if you don't, don't blame her, blame me. Because um, I, I want to deal with a few myths about applied behavior analysis, um, because I think that that's an important thing to deal with up front in this effort of open and respectful and collaborative communication. Um, one myth that many people have is that really behavior analysis is mostly about training rats, pigeons, and other animals, and then just applying what we learn from non-human organisms to people without any thoughtfulness in between, and that's certainly not true. The experimental analysis of behavior has to do with this, and in fact, applied behavior analysis itself has to do with some animal um, applications. Uh, if you've ever watched The Dog Whisperer, Seriously, if you've ever watched The Dog Whisperer, you know, whatever he says he's doing, a behavior analyst looks at that and goes, oh, I know what you just did. You did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. He's applying the laws of behavior to the treatment of problem behavior in animals, right? And he's very, very good at it. Um, so it's certainly not mostly about animal research at all. Um, another myth, I think, is that behavior analysis takes this sort of mechanistic, impersonal view of human interactions and human behavior, that behavior analysts um, don't care about or believe in emotions, in social cognition, in any kind of private events, and that's certainly not true. I mean, radical behaviorism, in fact, is defined by the fact that radi radical behaviorists include private events as behaviors that are legitimate to study and to, um, and to deal with. So, you know, this sort of notion that it's really all about the clipboards and the lab coats and yada yada, you know, not true. Um, and then the, I think the final myth that I just want to put out there is that many people believe that behavior analysts primarily believe that and use punishment procedures to decrease problem behavior. And I'm, there may be some punishment procedures used in that endeavor, but really the emphasis is on a very, very different syllable these days. <laughs> <laughs> and and most, most contemporary behavior analysts understand the influence of environmental events, of antecedent events, and the importance of teaching new behaviors to remediate problem behavior um, such that punishment procedures um, you know, are part, may be part of a package, but are certainly not the sole endeavor. And, and uh, so that, that's a set of mythologies that I think I just want to deal with right up front. The other issue um, I th think is worth an analogy. And the analogy I make is the analogy with gravity. And this takes me back to the laws of behavior that I talked about before, right? Um, the laws of behavior 
exist in the universe, period. They exist. I didn't make them up. Skinner didn't make them up. I, you know, it, they just exist, right? Like gravity, right? If I go up on the roof of this building and I say I don't believe in gravity or I've never heard of gravity and I jump off the building, I'm going to fall anyway, right? Because gravity exists in the universe and the laws of behavior exist in the universe, right? Whether we know about them or whether we believe in them or not. The trick is, from a behavior analyst perspective, if we know about and understand these laws of behavior, how it is that human beings respond to these laws of behavior, then we can work with those laws of behavior rather than against them to improve people's lives. And for any behavior analyst, the end goal is to improve people's lives, to use the laws of behavior to improve people's lives. And that is the, that's the goal here. Not any behavior, socially meaningful behavior, right? And we seek to change to teach new behaviors, to decrease behaviors that are getting in someone's way um, by understanding those natural laws and applying them in ways that are ultimately habilitative. So, um, in a sense, the, a behavior analyst only takes advantage of what exists in the universe anyway, understands it, and then applies it systematically to, to socially meaningful problems. Um, the third myth um, that I want to deal with is, uh, is, has to do with behavior analysis. Many people equate, equate behavior analysis or apply behavior analysis with discrete trial teaching. Right? That's it. Right? And discrete trial teaching is a structured, adult-led, highly repetitive, often at a table, although not necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, training method um, whereby um, and often uh, kids are taught basic skills, kids or adults are taught basic skills. Um, they may be taught out of context. The tasks that, are in, that they engage in during discrete trial teaching may or may not be functional. Um, often the reinforcement that's offered for desired behavior isn't related to the task itself. Um, and there may be punishment for undesired behavior in a, um, in a discrete trial um, situation. Now, th this is sort of classic discrete trial, not contemporary discrete trial. Contemporary discrete trial teaching will be much more flexible. But the point I want to make is that behavior analysis is much more than just discrete trial teaching. Um, and and uh, so I offer you this umbrella of uh, applied behavior analysis um, packages or, 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 or um, treatment approaches, intervention approaches that, of course, include discrete trial teaching, which has its place in certain c circumstances for certain kids, but also strategies like direct instruction, applied verbal behavior, precision teaching or fluency instruction, pivotal response treatment, the Early Start Denver model, which is a marriage of applied behavior and analysis and developmental practices, certainly falls within the umbrella, and there are others as well that aren't as branded as these may be. And so th there's a, a wide range of how a behavior analyst may take the laws of behavior and instantiate those laws into an intervention package um, to, um, to achieve desired outcomes. Let me, for example, show you an example, at one of many I could show you, of what contemporary ABA may look like. This is a short video clip. All right, can you find something you want? What's, what's, what is this? Letter. It's a game? What kind of game? Letter game, the alphabet bean bag. Okay, let's play on the floor. What are these called? Uh, Do you remember what they're called? They're bean bags. Bean bags. With what on Letters, all right. Hey, what color do you want to be? What do we do? We throw them? Okay. You, how about you pick three colors to be? You have green. You have, what, what color is that one? Red, okay. And orange, okay, those are your three. Do you see anything else that you need? Not, not down, that's mine, silly. You need more? More what? Green. Yeah. You need more green ones. And what else do you need? Red ones. Red ones. And what else do you need? Orange. 
orange ones. Okay, so now I have black. And what other color should I be? What color is this? Yellow. yellow. Very cool. How many yellows are there? One, two, three, four. Four and... Okay. Wait, okay. One, two, three, four, five. five. Okay, and I'm going to be purple. Notice the instructors using the letter B bag activity to work on several targets. Color and letter identification, conversational exchanges, and problem solving to find missing items are all incorporated within the same activity. We're going to aim for this box and we're going to throw them in, okay? Who's going to go first? You are? Okay, go. Did you make it in or did you miss? You missed. Oh, alright. Alright, it's my turn. Yes! Ooh. What color is it? Which color is this? Purple. Nice. Oh, yeah, get it in there. Okay, I have a question for you. Should I throw, which letter should I throw? What is this one? P. P, and the P makes what sound? P. Good. Which one are you going to throw? What is it? P. Good job, and I'm going to throw H. H like... What word starts with H? Ham. Yeah. yeah. Ham? I love ham. <laughs> okay. How does that, how is that applied behavior analysis? There were specific goals that he was working on. He used clear uh, directions. He used instructional procedures that fall within the discipline. He reinforced appropriate behavior. He prompted, he used systematic error correction. He worked on a variety of tasks at once. I mean, there were discrete trials in there, but they weren't kind of the kind of discrete trials that most people have in mind when they think about that kind of teaching. Um, and that's certainly a, a, one example of what a contemporary ABA may look like because it does incorporate a number of the, um, the strategies that fall under that, that umbrella. Okay, so that kind of deals with a bit behavior analysis. Let's move on and talk about credentialing because I think this gets a little complicated and I want to kind of work through it with you. Um, there is a board, uh, an international board called the Behavior Analyst Certification Board that is the international credentialing program for professional behavior analysts. And there are two credentials under that program. The Board Certified Assistant Behavior Analyst and the Board Certified Behavior Analyst, BCABA and the BCBA. In British Columbia, the BCABA credential is available through coursework and practicum that's offered at Douglas College and also at Capilano University. In Canada, the BCBA credential is offered in three places, UBC, University of Manitoba, and Brock University in Ontario. There are also other community colleges in Ontario that offer the BCABA credential. So, and in the States, there are like bazillions of places that offer both, both live and online. And really, as I said, this is international. So there are credentialing universities and college programs all around the world. In British Columbia, this group of people we call behavior consultants are not the same as credential behavior analysts necessarily. So there are four ways you can be a behavior consultant in British Columbia. One is you can have a master's degree. You can also have the BCBA credential. Okay, so you're a master's degree plus BCBA, in which case you've had 225 hours currently, under the current regulations, 225 hours of ABA coursework, some of which is undoubtedly has to do with autism or is applicable to autism. There's an exam that one has to pass. There has been supervised experience a vari various um, numbers of hours depending upon how the supervision was provided. So 
if the supervision is provided outside of a university, for example, uh, someone's required to accumulate 1,500 hours of supervised experience, less if it's um, supervised um, on a more regular basis or through a university program. And BCBAs are required to accumulate 36 hours of continuing education every three years. So that's one way one can be a behavior consultant in BC. A second way is the same but not a BCBA. So now the person has a master's degree but hypothetically only six hours of autism or ABA coursework, one course in each of those areas, right? There is no exam because there is no credential. There has to be a certain amount of supervised experience for folks un serving kids under six now we're talking about. Um, and the amount of supervised experience is, um, is specified. And there is no requirement currently for continuing education. So that's plan B or plan two. It's also possible to be a behavior consultant at the bachelor's level in BC. So now I'm a bachelor's level behavior consultant and I have my BC ABA credential, which means I've had 135 hours of ABA coursework, some of which has undoubtedly included specific autism or generic autism information. I've passed an exam. I've gotten a certain amount of supervised experience, less than a BCBA, but a substantial amount of supervised experience nonetheless, and I'm expected to um, engage in regular continuing education. Right? Or I could be a bachelor's level behavior consultant with no BCBA, in which case I have a bachelor's degree in a relevant field, and all of these are relevant fields, so it could be education, special education, psychology, um, speech language pathology, um, you, you know, whatever, right? Um, you know, generally not like computer science or geography, generally not, right? Now again, I've had six hours of required coursework. I haven't taken an exam because I don't have a credential. I do have supervised experience and there's no requirement for continuing education. So the, I think some of the confusion in BC is that people, is that all of these people are called the same thing, right? They may distinguish themselves by saying, I'm a B list, right? Or an A list behavior consultant. Usually that jargon doesn't come along with it, right? Um, and, but all of, those, all of these people currently in British Columbia are called the same thing. And you can see that there's a wide variety of experience, coursework, ongoing training, and so forth and so on. Um, this, is not an un this is not a BC issue. This is not a BC problem, right? It is, you know, the incidence of autism and the need for um, uh, applied behavior analytic services happened so quickly over the past 10 to 15 years in North America and around the world that every place that I know of, every place that Tracy knows of, and she'll talk herself about this in a bit, is struggling with this issue of how do we deliver the service when there aren't enough people who are highly credentialed and we have to, at least in the meantime, and of course speech language pathology was in this situation many, many years ago. It used to be you could be a speech language pathologist with just a bachelor's degree. And then people went like, well, no, that's probably not a good idea. You know, we need to, right? And the requirements gradually got got in, got jacked up and right and we're, we're where we are now, right? And in the future, they they're, they may increase even more. I mean, it's difficult to know. But this is what happens in an evolving pro pro profession. As May said this morning, you know, it took here in British Columbia um, many, many years, what, 30, 40 years for the College of Speech Language Pathology, it's not called that, but you know what I mean, to be established because it's an arduous process, it's a very expensive process, and it's a difficult process to get through. So that's a profession that in many ways is ahead of behavior analysis, right, in that it's been around for longer and it's had time to sort of get to the point of being credentialed and having a regulatory body. Behavior analysis at least when it comes to serving kids with autism, is re a relatively infant profession, at least in British Columbia, and it's obviously going to take a while for those same kinds of um, credentials and other kinds of things to accrue. And I'll come back to that in just a bit. Now, 
in when we talk about so May talked about well what in um, from a speech language pathologist perspective what are the standards that are expected to call something an evidence based practice right and the standards for behavior analysts are sim similar but uh, come from a, a somewhat different source depending upon you know who you line up with and you know who you're reading these days um, it, you may have you know slightly different criteria but the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorder offer these guidelines and I think these guidelines are generally accepted in the area of behavior analysis and that is that there need to be at least two high quality that is very well done all the I's dotted and T's crossed studies with randomized or quasi-experimental designs um, that are conducted in an area or three groups of researchers who co conduct five high quality studies each using single case design for a total of somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 participants. Right. So it, one study doesn't make something an evidence-based practice and of course all of the studies have to agree. So if there's five studies that use randomized control trials that say something Thing doesn't work and two that say it does work then the balance of evidence is it doesn't work and it wouldn't be considered an evidence-based practice of course some combination of the two um, can also be used and so some examples of things that are now considered evidence-based practices that have an ABA foundation are things like the picture exchange communication system there have been a number of meta-analyses now and large-scale studies looking at the effectiveness of um, that instructional procedure to teach uh, the use of symbols for augmentative communication um, showing quite clearly that there's enough evidence to consider that an evidence-based practice. Video modeling is an evidence-based practice. Discrete trial teaching, discrete trial training is certainly considered an evidence-based practice. Since the LOVA study in 87 there have been 16 um, replications of those results at various levels um, showing that that approach can be effective. Um, functional communication training, the practice by which we, and we teach someone a communication, uh, to use some kind of communication modality um, to communicate the same message that he's now communicating with his problem behavior. Right? Such that as he's communicating that message better, the problem behavior goes down and the use of that message increases. That's a strategy called FCT, functional communication training. That's certainly considered an evidence-based practice. So there are a number of communication and language intervention options that are considered EBP in the field of behavior analysis. Um, so how do behavior analysts slash behavior consultants um, approach this task of supporting language and communication development. Um, again, May talked about this when she talked about the behaviorism in influences on speech language pathology. Uh, a behavior analyst takes the perspective that language is a learned behavior. It's certainly influenced by one's biology that is neurobiology in particular, other parts of biology as well. Right? But it's certainly influenced by the, a person's environmental history, it's influenced by that person's current history, and it's influenced by cultural context. But it's not innate. There may be parts of, there may be some seeds of language that are innate to human beings. That is, all human beings have the potential for language development, unlike, for example, wasps. Right, but um, but that ultimately it's a learned behavior, and it develops through the inter by the interaction between an individual and his or her environment. Um, so, a, a decidedly non Chomsky <laughs> um, perspective on on the whole thing. Right now, um, a, a sub um, a sub set of um, practices and. Um, uh, uh, applications in the area of language communication come out of Skinner's book um, called Verbal Behavior. And um, the application of the ideas that he played out, this uh, verbal behavior of the book was not an intervention, wasn't about intervention at all. It was his description of 
language and communication development and how it all works and how the environment influences and, and all of that, right? People have taken it and turned those ideas into application and often that approach is called, well, sometimes just verbal behavior or applied verbal behavior, AVB. But, the, but um, Skinner's idea was that, um, that we can consider language <coughs> in functional units, which is kind of a combination of form and use as May described it. Um, and there are, pro in autism there are four primary areas where the research has focused. So the research has focused very much on what Skinner called echoics. The word that you and I would use is imitation, right? You have to have jargon to be a respectable profession. <laughs> a profession that doesn't invent its own jargon you know it's like an Italian who doesn't know how to cook spaghetti sauce I don't think so so we gotta have special words Skinner was very good at special words so if I say cookie to a child and he says cookie back that's an echoic you might call it an imitation whatever okay um, well, I mean, I say whatever, you know, but part of the struggle that we, if you will, have together is the jargon, right? Because speech-language pathologists, oh, you're very good at this too, aren't you, jargon? <laughs> you know, you got your semantics and your, yeah, 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 what are you talking about? We don't know, right? So, but, but, and uh, it's important because these are meaningful things. These are meaningful concepts, ideas, principles. They are meaningful, um, to, to the people who understand what they mean, but they, are, they can be barriers between us if we don't understand each other's language. And so part of what we need to be doing together is that translation. So here's a little translation for you. So we call man's what you might call a request, right? So cookie isn't just cookie. Cookie can be an echoic. I say cookie, you say cookie. Cookie can be a manned, right? Kid says to me, cookie please and gets a cookie, now cookie is used in a man context. Cookie can be tacked, a tacked is like a label, okay? So kid points and says, that's a cookie, or cookie, and now he doesn't want it, he's just telling me, cookie, that's a cookie. And I don't give it to him, I say instead, yes, that's a cookie, that's a chocolate chip cookie, right? If I've been working closely with speech pa language pathologists, I might say, yes, that's a big chocolate chip cookie <laughs> or a big red chocolate chip I expand the utterance see okay so cookie is used in that situation and or an intraverbal an intraverbal is I say to the kid um, how does the cookie taste and he says good so now I've used the word cookie right right and he answers me in Right, so it's a different kind of understanding of that word. So, and then there are additional functional units, things like autoclitics, don't ask, that haven't <laughs> haven't had a lot of research, and especially in the area of autism. But there is this there is this conceptual underpinning uh, around the different um, forms and uses of behavior that I think that it is very meaningful for people in who are behavior analysts and behavior consultants and may actually be problematic if we don't do a good job of translating that to each other. So that, that's a little bit of an overview there. I know that all the verbal behavior people out there are going, gee, she really, she, I, she, I should be doing this piece. She's not doing a very good job with it. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, as May explained how an SLP may approach the task of um, assessment and intervention, let me briefly deal with that as well, and then I'm going to um, finish here. Um, a behavior analyst, a behavior consultant would approach the task of language assessment and intervention by first conducting a comprehensive assessment of a person's language and communication skills that per, uh, uh, someone might use, for example, the Verbal Behavior Milestones Assessment and Placement Program, also known as VBMAP, which, is, which comprehensively goes through the different aspects of language and communication development and allows assessment of what can the kid do, what does the kid need to learn to do. There are many, many other um, um, assessment 
um, rubrics that might be used as well, would then identify barriers to learning, what, what's getting in the way, this kid doesn't imitate very much, there's a lot of vocal stereotypy that's getting in the way, you know, <laughs> that's what he does most of the time and it's kind of hard to get him to actually make meaningful speech sounds because there's so much of that. Right, so I need to understand that's getting in the way and how am I going to deal with that. Um, obtaining developmental comparison data is, a, is an important component, something that sometimes, to be true, to be honest, doesn't happen um, for behavior analysts, but certainly is part of the expected um, practice. We then see consultation with an SLP should be doing this on a routine basis to advise, especially on areas outside of a behavior analyst expertise. So some behavior analysts, some behavior consultants are quite well trained on um, sort of developmental language development, the, the, the language development for typically developing kids because they've had that as part of their background depending upon where they've studied and depending upon what their undergraduate and graduate degrees are. Other behavior consultants slash behavior analysts may really know very little about the developmental milestones that are meaningful and important and that behavior consultant, behavior analyst ought to be working very closely with an SLP to make sure that he or she isn't teaching the kid or trying to teach the kid things that are so developmentally out of whack with where the kid's right at right now that it's going to be impossible for him to acquire those new skills. Right? And there are many, many, many areas where you know, behavior analysts may be trained but may not be trained. Behavior consultants may be trained but may not be trained in specific areas, things like feeding, things like you know, uh, articulation, um, pronouncing letters, all kinds of things right? where it's really important to pair with professionals um, who have that expertise. Um, the intervention goals ideally are then developed collaboratively Teaching strategies are developed to produce rapid skill acquisition. The goal of a behavior consultant, behavior analyst is rapid, efficient skill acquisition. And if that's not happening, then adjustments will need to be made to the program. Right? Again, this doesn't always happen, but it's supposed to happen. It's part of the standards of practice. Right? If I'm doing a program with a kid for months and months and nothing's happening, well, weeks and weeks and nothing's happening, right? Changes need to be made. And then, of course, the training of interventionists, caregivers, teachers, other people who are important, and siblings, grandparents, to implement the interventions is also part of the scope of practice. So th that's the general approach to that task of behavior assessment and intervention. Behavior consultants are also able to and expected to um, engage in the uh, functional behavior assessment and the design of behavior support strategies to produce desirable changes in problem behavior. Right? So it's not that behavior consultants, behavior analysts don't do this. It's, not, it's just that that's not all they do. Right? So and we know that interventions based on function are way more effective than, um, and less intrusive than interventions that are not based on effectives on, on um, function. So behavior, functional behavior assessment is an expected part of the practice. Um, and, um, and obviously, this is a place where behavior consultants may be useful to SLPs in helping SLPs develop strategies for dealing with problem behavior during SLP session, sessions. So it's one of the many ways that that we can um, exchange competencies. Um, behavior consultants are also expected to supervise and implement intervention programs for kids or adolescents in BC. It, only behavior consultants on the RASP can do this for kids under six, but behavior consultants in general can do it for kids over six. Um, and those intervention programs will address multiple repertoires. Uh, language and communication, daily living skills, pre-academic and academic skills, play skills, social skills. Behavior analysts are trained broadly to deliver instruction across all of those areas. Again, some may be more trained in some of those areas than others. And it's, of course, we understand, should understand, that it's important to acknowledge our own limitations and only practice within the scope of our experience and training. 
Um, and finally, the behavior consultants teach families and teachers to promote maintenance and generalization of communication skills. So if a behavior consultant's working with a student um, and getting good outcomes, it's not good enough that the kid can do those outcomes with the behavior consultant, has to be able to do them in natural settings as well. So we use evidence-based training strategies that include things like instructions, modeling, rehearsal, video modeling, and so forth and so on for generalization. So, you know, this is a very confusing area, I think, for many speech-language pathologists, partly because a behavior consultant isn't just one thing. It, a behavior consultant, and I mean, it's actually even more comp complicated than that, because even a behavior consultant with a master's degree who's a BCBA may have gotten their master's degree in applied behavior analysis, or may have gotten their master's degree in a broader area like special education or developmental psychology. So there may be a very specific focused background in ABA or it may be more generic as a background. So it gets even more complicated than just four ways, but I've tried, four, I think four is complicated enough. <laughs> so the punchline here is that we really are dealing with a situation where in BC right now, behavior consultants have a wide range of training, experience, and expertise. They are not only trained to deal with problem behavior, but exactly what a behavior consultant is trained to do may vary widely depending upon the level and type of training. And But at the end of the day, a behavior consultant slash behavior analyst is prepared to offer evidence-based strategies for instruction instruction for excellent, efficient, rapid teaching across domains and for addressing problem behavior. So in a sense, think about a behavior analyst as an instructional expert across domains rather than someone who focuses on a particular domain and delivers instruction in that context. Now I've given you some resources if you're interested in Googling when you get home tonight, I'm sure you're all going to want to do this, um, you know, to look at some websites that are relevant to this, but I hope this has been a, a little bit useful at least in giving you a broad overview of what this important profession looks like. Thanks.